Coming up in the next hour, we explain all the important stuff you need to know about photography. Exposure, depth of field, focus, as well as busting some myths. Welcome to Photography Online. This month we are doing something a little bit different from usual. Basically the entire team are currently out on back-to-back -back workshops for the entire month so I'm basically here on my own. Now I know that many of you really engage with the simplified way that we explain all of the usually complicated stuff about photography so I thought we might compile a few of your favourite features and topics into one show. For regular viewers you will have seen all of this content before in previous shows but I know many Many of you will have missed the odd episode here and there and of course some of you will be new to the channel and we wouldn't want you to miss out on what we do best. So to kick us off let's look at one of the most important elements of composition, perspective. This is all to do with where you choose to stand, something which many photographers don't give enough thought to. Adjusting your distance to your subject can give you incredible power and control over the balance of your photo, but it's a common myth that it's focal length that's doing this. Here's Marcus to prove the point. One of the greatest myths, maybe even the greatest myth in photography, is that focal length influences perspective, i.e. the compression and expansion of a scene. Now, you'll even read this in textbooks or hear it from experienced pros, but it's simply not true. Now, I'm gonna prove this to you now because I can already hear some of you shouting at me. The most common misconception is that longer focal lengths compress a scene, making the background appear closer to the foreground, and shorter focal lengths do the opposite by stretching the scene, pushing the background further away. Have you ever heard a photographer say something along the lines of, I used a telephoto lens to compress the scene. Well, this is all nonsense. And if you're gonna master composition, then you need to understand what's truly going on. Because if you think that changing your focal length is gonna change the perspective of the scene, then you're gonna struggle. So let me explain our experiment we're gonna do here. We've got our subject in the background, which in this case is a church or what used to be a church. And then we've got our subject in the foreground. Where did she go? Oh, there you are. And you're, you've got to stay still, okay? You mustn't move. You see this header that you're standing on? Yeah. You mustn't move from when you're, where you're standing, okay? Because I need you to stay a fixed distance from the church, okay? So what I'm gonna do is we've got a variety of different focal lengths, the widest being 12 millimeters, the longest being 200 millimeters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a series of shots and I'm gonna double my focal length each time. So I'm gonna start at 12, and then we're gonna go 24, 50, 100, 200. And each time, I'm gonna also double my distance from my beautiful foreground subject here. And then we'll see what that effect has on how big and small the church becomes. So, first one, I'm gonna go two meters from my foreground subject, which is about here, and I'm gonna shoot at 12 millimeters. So, let me do this one here. I, uh, you can smile if you want to. I mean, it's up to you. Uh, I'm going to come even closer, actually. I'm going to go to one metre because that's just the way I roll. So, do you think that's one metre away? No. You mean... There we go. Right. You've got to stay still, remember? Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture of you here at one metre. You're going to smile, strike a pose. The things to notice here are firstly how much of the vertical frame Shiana is taking up, which I would say is around 75%. Also, notice how far away the church appears to be in this shot. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double my distance. What's double one metre? Two metres. Two metres. And I'm going to double my focal length. What does that say there? Twelve. What's double twelve? Double twelve is twenty-four. Okay, so we're going to go to twenty-four. So I double my distance, which is there. I doubled the focal length. Okay, can you strike that pose again? Doubling my distance from Shiana will make her half the size in frame, but doubling my focal length will double her size in frame. So the net result is that she stays the same size, still 75% of the vertical frame. 
but the church has become twice the size, so appears to be closer than it was in the first shot. So that's my one at two meters and at 24 millimeters. So now I'm gonna double that again. So what's double two meters? Three meters. No. What school are you going to? What do you mean? What's double two meters? Four meters. Thank you, All right. Double one more. It like, anyway, right, we've doubled. This is, uh, this is four meters here. So strike your pose again, go. As you can see, Shiana is the same size in the frame, but the church has doubled in size and appears to be getting closer. But I can assure you, it is not. So now I need to double it again. So what's double four? Double four is eight. Eight. And what's double 50? Okay, so we're gonna go to eight meters, which is about here somewhere. Yeah, looks good. Give me that pose. Once again, the church has doubled in size, but by doubling both my distance to the foreground and my focal length, Shiana is the same size in the frame. So now we're gonna do one more. Uh, so I'm gonna go to 16 meters, I'm doubling it again, and I'm gonna double my focal length from 100 to 200. Just bear with me for a moment. So this must be about 16 meters here. I'm at 200. Now the church looks like it's right behind Shiana. This is one of the most useful tools in composition, controlling the weight of the foreground and the background to get the optimum relationship. So here's the important part, just to prove that it's my distance that's changing the perspective and not the focal length. I'm now gonna change back to the 12 millimeter and take it from this point here. Bear with me. Uh, don't worry, we're nearly there. So, I'm back to 12 millimeters. This is where I took the same shot at 200 millimeters. So I'm just gonna replicate that again. Give me one more. So here's the proof that focal length does nothing to influence perspective, as the perspective in this shot taken at 12 millimeters is exactly the same as the one taken at 200 millimeters. The size of Shiana compared to the church in both shots is identical. The only difference being that both look far smaller in the 12 millimeter version because that's what focal length does. It controls the magnification. If we crop into the 12 millimeter version and compare it to the 200 millimeter version, we can see that the two perspectives are indeed the same. So, as you can hopefully see, it's the distance from the subject which compresses the scene, not the focal length. If we now compare all the photos, rather than state the focal length, which is what you would typically see in a textbook, we should really state the distance, as this is the force at play here. So the myth that longer focal lengths compress a scene and shorter focal lengths exaggerate a scene is totally false. But I understand where the theory comes from, and it's because we tend to photograph things that are a long way away with telephoto lenses and things that are very close to us with wide angle lenses. But it's important to remember that it's our distance to the subject which is changing perspective, not the focal length. So don't wrongly assume that focal length can squash or stretch a scene. A lens can't bend the laws of physics, it just focuses the light onto the sensor. Focal length does nothing but magnify that image. That's it. When we first aired that feature, it opened a lot of people's eyes to the concept of perspective, so we thought it was worth showing again. All right, well, once you're standing in the right place, to give you the desired balance between your foreground and your background, the next thing you're likely to do is focus. Whether you do this manually or automatically, the act of focusing is fairly straightforward. Controlling objects in front of or behind of where you're focused is known as depth of field, and this has been causing confusion for photographers since the invention of the medium. But fear not, because Marcus is back to explain everything everything in simple terms. When it comes to understanding the technical side of photography, there's one area which causes more confusion than any other, and that's depth of field. It is, however, quite easy. So rather than feeling snookered, see what I did there? 
I'm going to show you in layman's terms just how easy it is. If you saw April's edition of Photography Online, Harry explained all about something called the plane of focus, an invisible wall which moves further and closer from the camera as we turn the focus ring on the lens. Only subjects which are positioned exactly on this plane of focus are ever truly sharp. All objects closer or further away are always going to be out of focus, but to varying degrees. And this is where depth of field comes in. Many photographers assume that by changing the aperture, we change the amount of our scene that's in focus, but this isn't actually true. Anything behind where we're focused or in front of where we're focused is always going to be out of focus regardless of which aperture we use. So let me demonstrate with some coloured balls. So if I focus on the pink ball here, you can see that the red ball, which is behind the plane of focus, is clearly not sharp. And the blue ball, which is in front of the plane of focus, is also not sharp. Only the pink ball or anything on that plane of focus is sharp. So if I place a yellow ball at the same distance from the camera as the pink ball, it's impossible to get one in focus and one out of focus. If you focus on one, the other one will automatically be sharp. Now let's look at what happens when we change the aperture. This diagram shows our snooker ball setup. We are looking side on to the camera and we are using a large aperture, as can be seen by the big opening in the lens, which is letting lots of light through. Here's our pink ball, which is appearing on the sensor as finely focused points of light, as it is lying on our plane of focus. The blue ball, which is in front of the plane of focus, is being brought to a finely focused image behind our sensor, which means that when it hits our sensor, instead of each point of light appearing sharp, they appear as fuzzy areas known as circles of confusion. The red ball, which is behind our plane of focus, is being brought to a finely focused image in front of the sensor, which means by the time the points of light have reached the sensor, they have crossed over and are now also appearing as circles of confusion. The further away from our plane of focus a subject is, the larger the circles of confusion will be. As we focus, the lens moves closer and further away from the sensor, bringing different distances into focus. But let's stick with our setup here where I'm focused on the pink ball. Now I'm not going to move any balls and I'm not going to move the camera. All I'm going to do is reduce the aperture down to a tiny value. What this is going to do is it's going to make the circles of confusion so small that it's difficult to distinguish between circles of confusion and finely focused points of light. However, if we enlarge the image enough, we'll see that things that originally appeared in focus are actually still out of focus. So let's go back to our diagram and see what happens when we close the aperture of the lens. You can see that the pink ball is still being finely focused onto the sensor. The blue ball is still being focused behind the sensor, but the lines are crossing at a much shallower angle, meaning that when they hit the camera sensor, they appear as smaller circles of confusion than they did when using a larger aperture. The same happens with the red ball, which is still being brought to a finely focused image in front of the sensor, but the smaller aperture is now causing the points of light to cross over at a shallower angle, meaning that the circles of confusion on the sensor are smaller. So in contrast to what many photographers believe, Changing the aperture doesn't actually mean more of our scene is in focus. It just means that anything behind or in front of the plane of focus is less out of focus at smaller apertures than it is at bigger apertures. So it could be argued that there is no such thing as depth of field, as a lens can only focus on a single plane at any time. However, we need to imagine depth of field does exist in order to control how our scene is rendered. So in your mind, imagine that depth of field is the thickness of your plane of focus. And as you change the aperture of your lens, this invisible wall gets thicker and thinner. Got that? Good, because now we're going to look at the other influences of depth of field. There are three in total. The first one we've already looked at is aperture. The next one is focal length. And the last one is our distance to the plane of focus. When it comes to focal length, the longer the lens, the shallower the depth of field will be at any given aperture. So here I have three lenses. I have a 50 millimeter, I have a 24 millimeter, which is exactly half the focal length. And then I have a 100 millimeter, which is exactly double the focal length. So we're gonna start by looking at the difference between the 50 millimeter and the 100 millimeter. So first of all, I'm gonna take the shot with a 50 millimeter lens at F8. Now the balls aren't gonna move and the camera's not gonna move. I've got the white ball here to make sure that the camera, when I change lenses, the camera's position 
is exactly the same. Both of these images are taken at f8, and the distance to the pink ball, our plane of focus, remains the same. The only thing which has changed is the focal length, which is why the balls in the 100mm version appear twice the size, because we've doubled the focal length, or zoomed in twice as much. As you can see, the blue and the red ball appear more out of focus in the 100mm version. So now I'm going to take the same shot again, this time at 24mm, still at f8, and the camera hasn't moved because I'm going to back it up onto the cue ball here. The blue and the red ball appear to be more in focus, but this is only because the circles of confusion are smaller on a wide angle lens than they are on a telephoto. When it comes to our distance to plane of focus, the closer we are to our subject, the shallower our depth of field, and the further away we are from our subject, the deeper our depth of field. So I'm gonna take the same shots again, this time with a 50 millimeter lens, and I'm gonna use F4, and I'm gonna take two shots, one close up, which is there, so I'm still focused on the pink ball. And now I'm gonna take the same shot again from back here, still focusing on the pink ball, same aperture, same lens, nothing's changed in that regard. Look at these two examples, both taken at f4 with a 50 millimeter lens. The one where I was close up to the pink ball has rendered the red and the blue ball far more out of focus than the shot where I was further away. <sighs> oh my God, I need a rest. Thank you. Okay, so now we know the three influences of depth of field, here's how they affect the image we see. If we double the aperture value, say from f4 to f8, or from f11 to f22, we double the depth of field. If we double the focal length, i.e. from 50 millimeters to 100 millimeters, we effectively halve the depth of field twice. If we double the distance to our plane of focus, say from two meters to four meters, we effectively double the depth of field twice. So for those of you who are still following me, you may have noticed that those bottom two actually cancel each other out. Let me show you. If I use a 50 millimeter lens and focus on the pink ball from around one meter away and use an aperture of f5.6, the shot looks like this. If I now want to increase my depth of field, to render the blue and red balls more in focus, I can move back and double the distance of the pink ball to two meters, which will now, in effect, double my depth of field twice. I now take the shot and it looks like this. As you can see, the blue and red balls are less out of focus than they were when I was only one meter away. However, the balls have become too small for my liking, as they are now half their original size because I doubled my distance from them. To get them back to their original size, there's only one thing I can do without moving closer to them, and that's to zoom in by using a longer focal length. If I double the focal length, the size of the balls will also double, getting them back to where they were. But by doubling the focal length, I effectively halve the depth of field twice, undoing what I had gained by moving further away. So I'm back where I started and haven't actually changed the depth of field at all. So we only tend to use aperture to control depth of field because it has no counter effect, unlike the other two influences, which will always cancel each other out. It is, however, important to understand that our distance to our subject and our focal length also affect depth of field. If we understand this, then we'll realize why, if using a long lens and focused at something quite close, we're never gonna be able to get a deep depth of field. Or on the other end of the scale, if we use a very wide angle lens and we're focused a long way into the distance, we can never get a shallow depth of field. Both of these scenarios are impossible because two of the three influences of depth of field are working against you. A small aperture won't always give you a deep depth of field and a large aperture won't always give you a shallow depth of field if the two other influences, focal length and distance to plane of focus, are working against you. If you want a really shallow depth of field, then choose a long lens, a wide aperture, and try and get as close to your subject as you possibly can. You now have all three influences all pulling in the same direction, all leaning towards that shallow depth of field. If you want everything in focus, then choose a wide angle lens, a small aperture, and try and come as far back from your subject as you possibly can. All three things are now leaning towards maximizing your depth of field. Now, before I leave you with brain overload, if you have one of those apps or charts which tells you all about depth of field and where to focus, 
throw them away because they're of no use whatsoever. Here's why. The most important question to answer when it comes to deciding what is sufficient depth of field is how big is your image going to be and how close are you going to be viewing it from. Take a look at this photo. It looks like there's sufficient depth of field to render all the snooker balls sharply. So the depth of field is sufficient for the scene if this image is only ever going to be viewed as a thumbnail. However, if we enlarge the same image, say it's going to be used as an advertising billboard at a train station, then it's going to be printed at a large magnification. And importantly, people are going to be able to view it at close distances. We now need a totally different depth of field to render all the balls sharp. I can do this because I've asked myself those two important questions. A, how big is my image going to be? And B, how close is it going to be viewed from? No app or chart is ever going to ask you those questions, which is why they're next to useless. So hopefully I've given you enough information now to work out depth of field for yourself. I hope that all made sense. As you're starting to see, this episode is rammed full of information. So if you're already at the limit of what you can take on board for one day, feel free to stop here and come back when there's more capacity in the sponge to soak up some more information. Okay, well, still to come, we explain how different sensor sizes influence your images and bust another one of photography's greatest myths. We show you how to master exposure with a digital camera and we go to infinity and beyond when we look at using a cool focusing method. But first, First, let's talk histograms. So far in our Mastering Exposure series, we've explained all about the dynamic range of a scene and how this relates to that of our camera. In last month's show, we showed you how to use the exposure meter in your camera and explained why it can so easily lead you to make errors with your exposures. It was certainly a lot of information to take on board, but the good news is that today, I'm going to be showing you how to master exposure using your camera's histogram. Why is this good news? Well, it's because it's super easy compared to all of this one stop over, two stop under, where's my mid-tone malarkey. If you're not familiar with what a histogram is, don't worry. Even though it sounds like an unpleasant procedure you might have in an a &E department of a hospital with your legs up in the air, it's actually a graph on your digital camera, which makes the art of exposure a walk in the park. If you can drive a car, then you can expose a histogram. Let me explain. Let's assume we are driving down a road which is 10 meters wide and we have a stone wall on either side. As we drive down the road, if the car gets a little too close to the left hand wall, we simply adjust the steering wheel to position the car a little further to the right, back in the middle of the road. The smaller your car, the more room you have for error. If your car is only 4 meters wide, then you have 3 meters on either side before you scrape the wall. But if your vehicle is 8 meters wide, then you need to start concentrating a little more. The same principles apply when using a camera's histogram. But the good news is, you don't need to keep a lookout for anything coming in the opposite direction. A histogram is simply a graph which shows which tones your image is made up from. Starting from the left hand edge, this is pure black and represents the lower limit of your camera to accord detail. Then as you move across the graph from left to right, the tones get brighter and brighter, passing a mid-tone in the center, and then ending up at pure white when you reach the right hand edge, which is the upper limit of your camera's ability to record highlight detail. The gap between the left hand edge and the right hand edge is your camera's dynamic range. So when you take a photo, the camera will display the tones which make up that image on a graph. If the graph is too far over to the left, all you need to do is make the image brighter and you will see that the graph moves towards the right. If the image is too bright, the graph will be too far to the right. So you just need to darken the exposure to bring the graph back towards the center. As you can see, it's just like driving a car. We're simply trying to prevent the graph from touching the left and right hand edges in the same way we're trying to prevent our vehicle from touching the walls. The greater the dynamic range of a scene, 
or the wider our car, the more accurate we need to be with our exposure or with our steering. If after watching part one of this series, you worked out that your camera has a dynamic range of 10 stops, and you're wanting to shoot a scene that has a dynamic range of 12 stops, so that's the difference between the darkest and the brightest areas in your scene, you've got a problem in the same way that you would have if you wanted to drive a 12 meter wide vehicle down a 10 meter wide road. I can tell you now, that's not gonna fit. So what can we do? Let's stay with our steer in the car down the road scenario. We tried to keep the car in the middle of the road. Then we're gonna take out both our wing mirrors and we're gonna put scratches and dents down both sides of the car. I can tell you now that's not gonna end well. To reduce our repair bill, we could decide to just destroy the left side of the vehicle by driving as close to the right hand wall as possible without making contact with it. Now we've halved our repair bill by only destroying one side of the vehicle. It's the same with exposure. We simply need to decide whether we're going to sacrifice our shadows or our highlights, as we can't possibly retain detail in both. That's our job as a photographer, and it's one of the main reasons why using your camera in anything other than manual mode is simply removing your hands from the steering wheel of the car. You become a passenger. In most landscape situations, we sacrifice the shadows in favor of keeping details in the highlights. This is because the sky is often a key part of the scene. So it's important that we keep detail in this area. There are of course exceptions and don't be afraid to burn out your highlights if you acquire more shadow detail in a scene with high dynamic range. If your histogram touches the top of the graph box, this doesn't matter. It simply means your scene is made up of lots of that particular tone. It's the side you need to pay attention to, as once your graph touches these, your camera is no longer recording detail in the darkest or brightest tones, depending which side of the graph you are touching. Now what I've showed you so far is the luminance histogram which is usually displayed as white or gray. But there's also red, green, and blue histograms, which are averaged out to generate the luminance histogram. 95% of the time, the luminance histogram will suffice, and you won't need to be concerned about the RGB ones. But if you are photographing a scene where one color is strongly dominating, like this sunrise, which is made up primarily of red tones, then the luminance histogram, which is averaging out the red with the other two colors, may indicate that you are not touching the right-hand side of the graph. But if you then check the red histogram, you will see that you are in fact losing highlight detail after all. Just something to be aware of. Using the histogram on your digital camera is by far the easiest method of exposure. It shows you in one graph the dynamic range of your camera in relation to the dynamic range of the scene. All the information you need is right there. Don't worry if the image on the back of the camera looks too dark or too light. If the histogram looks good, your camera has recorded all the essential detail, which can then be revealed at the post-processing stage. And don't worry if the camera's exposure meter is saying your image is under or overexposed, as it doesn't know what you are photographing, so you can totally ignore that if you like. It essentially becomes redundant if using the histogram, which is hopefully good news if you want to simplify the process of manual exposure. Don't think that a good histogram should always be balanced. It shouldn't. If you're shooting a predominantly bright scene, such as a snow-covered landscape, then your histogram should be loaded to the right. If you're shooting a predominantly dark subject, then your histogram should be loaded to the left. A good histogram will only be evenly balanced if your scene has equal amounts of shadow and highlight, with midtones present too. If you see a U-shaped histogram, this means your scene is a high contrast one, full of bright and dark tones with little in the mid-tones. If your histogram looks like a hill or a mountain, this simply means you are shooting a low contrast scene, predominantly made up of mid-tones. 
It really is that easy. All you need to do is point your camera at the scene and take a test shot. You can use your camera's exposure meter to get you in the right area by making it show zero. The exposure it thinks is the correct one. Now examine the histogram of the shot. Remember the analogy with steering the car and either darken or brighten the exposure to ensure the graph is positioned as you want it. Then take your final image and your exposure will be perfect every time. For now, I'm going to try and drive my car back home without touching the sides. The histogram is probably one of the biggest advantages of digital cameras, so you really should be taking advantage of it. Hopefully, armed with the information we just explained, you can now take full control of your exposures and get perfect results every time. By the way, the topics we're covering here today represent only a taste of everything that we've covered since the launch of Photography Online three years ago. We've compiled everything we've featured into three volumes of books, one for each year. The first two are available from our online shop and we're working working on the third and final edition as we speak, so it won't be too long before the full trilogy is available. All right, well, earlier on, we looked at depth of field, but there's one closely related topic which we didn't mention, infinity focus. Here's Marcus, accompanied by a well-known expert on the matter, to explain. In previous shows, we've made many references to maximizing depth of field. Understanding the principles of controlling depth of field can be useful in almost any genre of photography, so it's one of the most important aspects to get to grips with. We've already done a detailed tutorial about depth of field, so I won't be repeating this again. Just check out this episode if you think you have a few gaps in your understanding of the topic and you'll see me using snooker balls to illustrate exactly what is going on when it comes to depth of field. The one thing I didn't cover is infinity, something which is really important if we want to have maximum control over our photography. But what is infinity and where is it? Now, the answer to the first of those questions is the easiest to deal with, so let's start there. When we focus a lens, we move the plane of focus either further from or closer to the camera. The plane of focus is an invisible wall and anything which comes into contact with this invisible wall will be sharply focused, regardless of the aperture used. As we bring the plane of focus closer to the lens, this invisible wall becomes thinner to the point where it may only be one millimeter or so in depth, such as with this shot which we featured in our previous show. But as we move the plane of focus further from the camera, even though we are not changing the aperture value, the wall gets thicker and thicker as it moves further and further away. If we move our plane of focus further into the distance, eventually we'll reach a point known as infinity. At this point, our two-dimensional invisible wall becomes a never-ending three-dimensional block, and anything covered by that block will automatically be in focus. To put it another way, infinity is the point we reach where, when we focus on a subject, everything behind that subject is automatically in focus too. So it's impossible to focus on an object at infinity and get another object further away out of focus. A good example would be if we had a tree on a distant hillside, maybe half a mile away, and the moon rising behind the tree at 240,000 miles away. If this sounds familiar, this was the scenario of our first Mission Possible feature, which we're still working on. If the tree is past the point of infinity, then it's impossible to focus on the tree and get the moon out of focus, even though the two are separated by almost a quarter of a million miles. As far as the lens is concerned, the two are at the same distance. So hopefully that explains what infinity is. So now for the slightly more challenging question, where does infinity start? This is dependent on the focal length, so there is no set point where we cross some magical line. Basically, the longer the focal length, the further into the distance we need to go before we reach infinity. Now there's a very precise way of working out exactly where infinity starts for any given focal length. And then there's a rule of thumb way, which is perfectly adequate for most situations. So let's start with this one first. All you need to do is convert your focal length in millimeters into meters, or if you're watching from America, maybe try yards. 
This is roughly where Infinity will start. So if we are using a 24mm lens, then Infinity will start somewhere around 24 meters from the camera. If we are using a 200mm lens, then Infinity won't start until somewhere around 200 meters away. And to take things to the extreme, if we are using a 1000mm lens, then we may not reach Infinity until around 1km or further. So that's the easy method, which as I said, will be perfectly suitable for most situations. Now, if you want to be more precise, either because you need to be, or maybe you just got too much time on your hands, there is another method which will tell you exactly where infinity starts for any given focal length. The first thing we need to do is find a scene where we have objects at various distances, including ones a very long way away. Remember that if you are using a long focal length, then infinity could be a kilometre or more away, so you'll need to be able to see something at least this far. It's important that we use manual focus for this, otherwise the camera might try to refocus during the exercise. Now what we need to do is focus on something we know to be at infinity. Now, on this 200mm lens here, I know that the cliffs in the distance are well past infinity, so that's where I'm going to focus. Now, without touching the focus ring, move either the camera or zoom around the screen to look at objects at closer distances, starting far away and getting gradually closer. As we do this, we will suddenly notice that one particular distance is very slightly soft. This is because we have just crossed the line of infinity for our set focal length. So now we need to go back to the previous distance which did appear sharp, and this is where infinity starts. Another way to do it, but only really relevant with fixed focal length lenses, is to find a scene where you've got a big expanse of flat ground before you. I'm going to use this 50mm prime lens. Just as before, focus on infinity and then get a friend to walk into the scene with a sign or large lettering on their clothing. As they start, they will be clearly out of focus, but the further away they walk from the camera, the sharper they will become. At the point where they become pin sharp is exactly where infinity starts. You can then measure that distance using a phone app and keep a record of it so that next time you're using the same lens for a landscape situation and need to know where infinity starts, you know exactly where it is. Now you can't really do this for a zoom lens because you'd have to do it for every single focal length and that's not really practical. If we now try the same exercise with the different focal length, we'll see that infinity starts in a different place. With the shorter the focal length, the closer we reach infinity. So this begs the most important question. Why do we need to know where infinity starts? This is important if we want to control depth of field. For example, if we are faced with a scene where the closest subject is 50 meters away, and the most distant subject is five kilometers away, we can shoot this on anything up to 50 millimeters in focal length without having to worry about depth of field, as everything in the scene is already at infinity. Basically, it's impossible for me to get part of this scene in focus and other parts out of focus, because even though I have many different elements all at different distances, as far as the lens is concerned, they're all at the same distance. This means that I can shoot the scene at f2.8 or at f16, it will make no difference to the depth of field. In such a situation, however, in order to maximize sharpness and detail, we should shoot the scene using the sweet spot of the lens. We explain why this is the case in this show, so check that out if you want to know the drawbacks of shooting at smaller apertures. If we are faced with a scene which includes foreground and background and want to achieve maximum sharpness, then knowing where infinity begins is key to getting this right. Now you might be familiar with the term focus a third of the way into the scene, but this is misleading and will actually give poor depth of field control. What we want to be doing is focusing a third of the way between the closest point we want to render sharp and where infinity starts, because only this will give us the maximum depth of field. If we are using a 16mm lens for this scene here, we only need to worry about getting everything from 2 meters to 16 meters sharp as everything beyond 16 meters is already past infinity, so it will take care of itself. If we simply focus a third of the way into the scene, this is probably somewhere around here, which is already well past infinity. 
So this would be totally wrong and would give us far less depth of field than focusing a third of the way between the closest point we want to appear sharp and the point where infinity starts. Finally, another question which pops up very often is why do some lenses focus past infinity? Older lenses tended not to do this. So to focus them to infinity, it was simply a case of twisting the focus ring until it stopped. In terms of distance, then there is nothing beyond infinity, although this guy might disagree. To infinity and beyond. But modern lenses are made to focus past infinity to allow for temperature changes, which may cause the optics to expand or contract slightly. So hopefully that explains what infinity is, where it starts and why it is so useful. Please don't ever ask me where infinity ends because that conversation will blow all of our minds, including his. You, my friend, are one of my favorite life forms. Really, the Space Ranger never lies. <laughs> ah, Marcus has finally made a friend. If you're enjoying all this information and finding it useful, then make sure you're subscribed to our channel as we have loads more similar content coming up next year on our new format show, which I'll be telling you all about next month. We've got a few major changes happening, which will allow us to make better content, which in turn increases the experience for you. So it's a win-win. Okay, well, coming up, we bust the myth on sensor sizes. In part one of our June show of Photography Online, I explained all about lenses in terms of focal length and aperture and busted one of the biggest myths in photography, that focal length changes the perspective of a scene. If you haven't already seen that, I urge you to watch it at some point as it's closely connected to what we're going to discuss here, how crop sizes influence magnification. This can cause all sorts of confusion, even to experienced shooters, but don't worry, because all is about to become clear as to why you need a 25 mm lens on a micro four thirds camera to get the same shot as you would with a 50 mm lens on a full frame camera. Let's assume we have the following cameras. A micro four thirds, such as an Olympus EM1 series, an APS crop camera, such as a Nikon D7500, a full frame camera, such as a Sony A7R, a 6x9 medium format film camera and a 4x5 large format film camera. Here's a diagram of all those sensor sizes to scale. Now let's assume that we have a 100mm lens on all of the cameras and we're taking a photo of this scene. All lenses project a circular image over the camera's sensor or film and obviously this circle needs to be big enough to cover the sensor in its entirety. A lens for a micro four thirds camera only needs to project a small circle to cover the sensor, which is why lenses for such cameras are smaller and lighter than lenses which need to project a larger circle to cover a bigger sensor. But let's put the size of the image circle to one side for a moment because it's really not that important. And let's assume that all 100 mm lenses are projecting exactly the same size image circle. If we take the photo on a large format camera, then the large film area records this. Using the same lens on a medium format camera, the film area or sensor will record the scene like this. Then, using the same 100 mm focal length on a full frame camera, it will record the photo like this. The APS sensor will record this and the Micro Four Thirds camera will record this. As I demonstrated last time, the focal length of the lens determines the magnification of the image and we can now see that the size of the sensor simply determines the crop. The smaller the sensor, the more aggressive the crop. Many photographers assume that sensor sizes influence the magnification of an image. They do not. All they do is record more or less of that image. Now, at a given size, let's say A4 for example, a smaller sensor will need to be enlarged to a greater degree, thereby giving the impression that it's providing more magnification. But this magnification is taking place outside the camera after the photo has been taken, so it can't possibly be to do with the sensor size. So a 50 mm lens will always give the same magnification, regardless what camera we use it on. 
For example, if our 50mm lens records a person in the center of the frame, that person will be the same size in every camera. For argument's sake, let's say this happens to be 15mm tall on the sensor. On the Micro Four Thirds camera, they will take up the full height of the sensor, whereas on the large format camera, they only take up a tiny portion of the image and therefore appear to be smaller in relation to the bigger dimensions of the image. But the important thing to remember is that they are identical in size. The size change comes when we magnify the smaller sensor image to a greater degree in order to fit a set dimension, let's say our computer screen. However, by magnifying the image to a greater degree, we are also magnifying all the imperfections of the lens, so the end result will not be as good. It's another one of those myths in photography that a smaller sensor size has a greater depth of field. It does not. A sensor has no influence over depth of field. It simply crops the image. The myth exists because if we take a photo with a 50mm lens on a full frame camera and want to replicate this on an APS crop sensor camera, we would need to use a 33mm lens to shrink the magnification so that the same image area covers the smaller sensor. The shorter 33mm focal length will give more depth of field, but it's important to realise that it's the lens doing this, not the sensor. However, there is no advantage in the smaller sensor because you can simply put a 35mm lens on a full-frame camera, therefore achieving the same depth of field, and then crop down to the same dimensions as the APS sensor. Yes, you will be throwing away pixels of information, but most full-frame cameras have more pixels than crop sensors anyway, so this negates the difference. Think of it like this. If you have a full-frame camera, then you also have an APS crop and a micro four-thirds camera, because you can simply crop the image to get exactly the same result. When it comes to image quality, there's no advantages with having a smaller sensor. Smaller sensors tend to pack the pixels tighter together, which means they collect less light and perform poorly in low light situations. The only overall benefit is that the smaller the sensor, the smaller the camera and the smaller and lighter the lenses will be. But this has nothing to do with the image, which is what we're talking about here. So if you put weight and size as a priority in your photography gear, then go for a smaller sensor. But if you want to retain maximum creative control and performance, then the larger the sensor, the more scope you have to play with. Okay, we still have one more feature to bring you and we're back on the topic of focus and depth of field. You might assume that if you want to achieve front to back sharpness in a scene which is both a foreground and background subjects, then you'd need a small aperture. But there is a way to get everything pin sharp, even at wide apertures where the lens will be performing at its best. Here's Marcus again to tell us more. A few months ago, I did a feature all about lens movements on a large format film camera to show how much control this gives us when it comes to getting as much of our scene sharp or as out of focus as we like. Many of you asked if the same control was possible with a digital camera, and the short answer is, mm, well, mm, kind of. To show you what is and isn't possible, I need to use both cameras to show you how they compare. Now I've chosen this scene here because it typifies what most of us are going to experience in a landscape situation, where we have the foreground at the bottom of the frame, our middle distance in the centre of the frame, and our background, which in this case is our mountains but is often the sky, at the top of the frame. Now set up as they are, both of these lenses are replicating what we would normally experience with a non-tilt shift lens, one that 99% of us will find ourselves using most of the time. The limitation with this is that the plane of focus is always parallel to the sensor, meaning that as we adjust the focus, all we do is move that plane of focus closer and further away from the camera. The closer to the camera, the thinner the plane of focus, but as we move this further away, it automatically becomes thicker. Everything that comes into contact with our plane of focus will be technically sharp, although not necessarily optically sharp. There are a number of reasons why something that's technically sharp might not be optically sharp, such as 
diffraction caused by the use of a small aperture, camera movement, subject movement, or even atmospheric conditions. We'll do a feature about getting things optically sharp another time, but today we're focusing, pun intended, on getting things technically sharp. Lens movements give us amazing control over focus by allowing us to tilt or twist the plane of focus so that rather than always being parallel to the sensor and therefore potentially only covering a small portion of our scene, we can lay it at an angle so that it covers far more or even all of our scene. When we use a standard lens, and by standard I mean one that doesn't have any movements on it, we tend to have to use a very small aperture in order to give the illusion that everything from front to back is pin sharp. But there are a couple of problems with this. Firstly, when we use such small apertures, we experience something called diffraction, which takes the edge off of the entire photo. Secondly, by closing down the aperture, we're not actually making the out of focus areas technically sharp, we're just making them less out of focus. Only objects in contact with our plane of focus will ever be technically sharp. This can become evident if we enlarge an image to a great degree, print it big, or view it from an extreme close distance. In essence, it may appear optically sharp at lower magnifications, but if it's not technically sharp, this will become obvious as we enlarge the photo. By using lens movements to lay the plane of focus over all the key areas in our scene, we can potentially get everything technically sharp from about a meter in front of the camera right up to infinity, maybe many miles away, even if we're using a wide aperture. This then allows us to use an aperture where the lens is working at its absolute best, meaning that we avoid diffraction and end up with a much sharper image. So let's look at this in practice and see how a digital camera with a tilt shift lens compares to a large format camera which has both front and back movements. Now it should be said that different tilt shift lenses from different manufacturers will all operate in a slightly different manner. This one here is a Canon 24mm Mark II which gives amazing control over all the various movements for reasons which we'll see in a moment. Many people think of tilt shift lenses as something architectural photographers use. And although they do, they would only typically make use of the shift element, not the tilt element, which is the part which gives us control over focus. The shift element is where we move the lens left or right. On this large format camera, it's actually the back which has the shift movement. On the digital tilt shift lens, it looks like this. Basically, the same thing which will achieve the same result. The image moves left and right. On a large format camera, we can also move the lens up and down, something known as rise and fall. But this too can be achieved with a tilt shift lens on a digital camera, simply by rotating the lens through 90 degrees and applying the same movement we did when we moved it left and right. The image now moves up and down without having to move the camera, ensuring the building remains undistorted. Compare this to how it would look if I had to tilt the camera up rather than the lens. The building now appears to be falling over backwards. With a large format camera, we can apply both shift and rise or fall at the same time. With some tilt shift lenses, we can do this also by rotating the lens so that it's partially between the horizontal and vertical positions. The more towards the horizontal we move it, the larger the proportion of shift compared to rise we get. So far, this can do everything that this can do, but let's continue and look at the tilt aspect. As mentioned earlier, tilting the lens downwards simply allows us to lay the plane of focus over more of our scene, allowing us to get near and far subjects on the same plane, something which just isn't possible on a standard lens. Using a tilt shift lens to focus is really quite simple. As far as I know, they're all manual focus. This one certainly is. So, you need to activate the live view and use the screen on the back of the camera. It's probably not going to work if you try and use the viewfinder. So all we're going to do is we're going to magnify the center, the very center of the image. It doesn't matter whether that's where your subject is or not. So I'm going to place the magnifying box over the center of the image and zoom in. Now all I need to do is focus the middle of the image. And if I come down, to the bottom of the image, we can see that that's very, very out of focus. But I don't want to touch the focus point now because we're focused on the middle of the scene. In order to focus the bottom, I'm going to apply 
some forward tilt. So I'm just going to tilt the lens until that bottom bit becomes sharp. And there we go. So now if we zoom back to the middle, that's still perfectly sharp where we were. And if we go up to the top, you can see that that's also sharp. So what we've essentially done is we've achieved front to back sharpness by laying the planar focus forward so it covers the entire landscape, even though we're at f3.5. In addition to tilting the lens forwards and backwards, we can also swing it left and right, which on a large format camera looks like this. We can do exactly the same with our tilt shift lens. All we need to do is twist it through 90 degrees and what was tilting forwards and backwards is now swinging left and right. Now this is really useful if you want to shoot down a wall and align the plane of focus so it goes right down the wall to get everything sharp. If we already have some rise, fall or shift dialed in, when we rotate the lens to change the tilt into swing, you would think that we would also have to rotate the shift element, therefore upsetting whatever effect it was achieving. But this particular tilt shift lens allows each control to be rotated independently, something which many others do not allow. So be aware of this before making any purchases. The real beneficiary of the tilt element is the landscape photographer. So it's surprising that more landscapers don't have one of these in their bag. Many large format cameras also have rear standard movements, which allow even more control over both focus and perspective. So if you see me using a large format camera on a future episode of Photography Online, and believe me, you will, then don't think that any of the lens movements that I'm showing you don't apply to you just because you have a digital camera. Get yourself a tilt shift lens and you can join in the fun and get control over your photography that you never knew was possible. No longer will you be limited with your depth of field and you'll never have buildings falling over backwards or lampposts leaning into frame. A tilt shift lens is a great addition to any landscape or architectural photographer's bag. So check out what's available for your branded camera. You'll soon be able to control depth of field like never before, ensuring your entire scene from front to back is pin sharp, even when using your widest apertures. Now there are caveats to this, and it's dependent on the scene that you're shooting. And we'll be looking at those on future large format features. So make sure you join me for that. So that concludes this show. As I mentioned, this is only a small taste of all the topics that we've covered over the past three years. So if you want to find out why you shouldn't shoot at f22, why using aperture priority might be holding you back, or delve into the world of hyperfocal focusing, then check out all of our shows for free, or you can purchase these books from our shop. I hope this show has been useful to you. We'll be back next month with our final show of the year, where we'll be chatting to the man who spent years scanning and editing all the Apollo moon photos, Nick will be telling us about a handy camera accessory and I'll be revealing all the exciting changes ahead for 2023. Don't miss that. Until then, take good care. But most of all, take good photos. So I'm going to show you in layman's terms just how easy it is. Now there is a more precise method which may... Oh, I've got to, I've got to Controlling objects in front of or behind where you are focused. Sorry, Hara. There are a number of reasons why something looks... Over the past three years. So if you want to shine out, shine, shine out. Firstly, by using such a small aperture, we get... All right, well, coming up, we bust the mint. The mint. Come on! When <laughs> editing all the Apollo moon photos, Nick will be telling about... Uh, You've got to hit one ball. <laughs>